So, Kevin Mitnick, thanks, thanks right. for uh, it's doing great this. Great to appreciate be here, it. Kevin. It's um, a great name, Kevin. Yes. <laughs> One thing we have very much yes. in common, that and our love for all things hacking and computer security. That's right. That's right. Um, you are definitely the most renowned hacker of our time. There's no doubt about it. And a lot of people wonder, you know, where did you, where did you learn all this? How did you learn to become a master social engineer? Is this something that you practiced growing up or? Well, before I became involved with computers, I was involved in a hobby called phone freaking, mm -hmm. which is basically like hacking the telephone system and doing really cool tricks with the phone network. And I was first introduced, it, it, I was first introduced to social engineering by another phone freaker who basically told me that he can call certain departments within the phone company and by understanding their terminology, their lingo, their the way they do business, mm -hmm. that you could obtain information by pretending to be one of them. So that's where I first got started, and I was kind of self-taught. Once I learned the basic of the fundamentals of how it worked, then the, I just developed that skill, mm -hmm. if you want to call it a skill. But how did you turn that into computers? When did you start getting involved with uh, PCs? When I was about 17, well, that was before 81. Um, it was a couple of years earlier, back in 1979 is another student at high school who incidentally was an amateur radio operator because I had a hobby of telephones and amateur radio, mm -hmm. which is kind of like advanced CB. And I met this other student who said, you know, I'd probably really like computers. And at first I wasn't really interested. And then he introduced me to the computer instructor who said, who asked, well, have you had trigonometry and blah, blah, blah? Mm -hmm. I said, no, I haven't taken those courses yet. He says, well, you can't get in a computer class anyway. So then my friend will show him some of the stuff you can do with the phone, Kevin. So I showed the teacher mm -hmm. some of these cool tricks, right? Even accessing computers through DTMF. And he waived the prerequisites to let oh, me into nice. class. When you did some of your hacking and social engineering, did you ever enlist the help of friends? Did you have like a community that you uh, were part of? Very small. One or two other people. Mm -hmm. And usually like um, when I was doing a, a lot of the hacking, uh, I'd have like one other friend and we'd be working together as a team. So right. how, uh, going back to when you started to commit these crimes and you were on the run, how long were you out and about for on the FBI? You were on the FBI's most wanted list, were you not? No, that's a rumor. Oh, that is a rumor. Okay. No, they, they, I think they, I'm the only guy where they had a wanted post, U.S. Marshals. Okay, U.S. Marshals. I had a wanted post there. I was never on the 10 most wanted list. That's okay. a rumor started by John Markoff. Okay. Um, I was a fugitive for about two and a half to three years. Most people, they're a fugitive for three days. How did you stay underground for three years? Oh, I mean, by, by adopting new identities. And uh, I, would, um, I, would, I would get a new identity. Uh -huh. and, how would you go about doing that? I mean, the internet, nowadays, you can go into Google, you type a new identity, you can learn how to create and forge documents. I mean, where did you get this information? Well, I, uh, I just used to re read a lot of underground books when I was a kid. BBSs and, and things like that? Not BBSs. This was like real like Paladine Press, mm -hmm. Eden Press. I was always interested in learning things that you're not supposed to know type of thing, right? Mm -hmm. And um, um, there was a book called The Paper Trip that basically explained the whole system of identity in America mm -hmm. of how it starts with the birth certificate. So the key is if you can obtain either a counterfeit or a real birth certificate, you can become that person. Mm -hmm. So there is a flaw in the system uh, in the states where if somebody dies in a state, a different state than they're born in, there's usually not a cross-reference, maybe between California and Nevada or sister states. Mm -hmm. But if somebody is born in D.C. and dies in California, there's, there's no cross-reference. So, so the government really doesn't know. Mm -hmm. uh, in, in a lot of cases, if somebody has a work history, their death will re be reported to the Social Security Administration. Mm -hmm. So they have a thing called the Social Security Death Index. But for infants, people that are one, two, three years of age when they die, there's no record okay. that's created. So the key is if you can find an infant that died in a different state than they were born in, you could become them. And that's wow. what I did. So how many, how many of these different identities did you go through? About three or four. So I knew the system so well and I knew their vulnerabilities, so I exploited them to be to get to create any identity I wanted. I'd go move from city to city and obtain le legitimate jobs and to support myself. Mm -hmm. Now, how did you know when it was time to switch identities? Or did you feel like pressure, like this one might be give you up, or well, actually, uh, in my first time, I, I left that job, 
and I figured, well, if I'm changing jobs, uh, I have to go look for something new anyway, so maybe it's a good time to switch up. I see. Okay. Yeah. Now, did any of this actually, your identities didn't give you away in the end. It was no. cell phone triangulating. Cell phone uh, by tracking me through cell phone usage. Okay. But they did find you. The wallet that you gave me, actually, about a year ago, had that was the wallet that you had all your fake IDs in, was yes, it not? Yes, absolutely. So how did because they... That was stupid. Because <laughs> the number one rule is, is you never carry any identity, any, any identity, identity documents with different names in your wallet. But see, I had this wallet in my home when, I was, when the FBI was executing a search warrant. I see. You, you'd never carry it on you. Right. That'd be stupid. Right. When you spent the time in prison, you said you were in eight months solitary confinement. Yes. What was that like? Tell me, I mean, tell me the, the whole rundown. You're locked okay, in a room. Okay, in your mind's eye, okay, you're in, a, you're in the room the size of a bathroom, say five by nine, mm -hmm. okay? It's maybe a 60 or 70 watt bulb, okay? There's a bunk, a toilet, and a metal sink. It, it kind of reminds me, uh, uh, we travel a lot between Las Vegas and San Francisco, mm -hmm. and we sometimes stop at I-5, and there's a particular... Um, gas station right past Livermore that has the same toilet and the same sink oh, that as, must be terrible. Yeah, as that was, you know, in, in federal detention, right? right? And we're like, oh my God, you know, where they buy this at a prison? <laughs> you know, so it's, I always want to get out of there quickly, yeah. right? So in any event, uh, you pretty much are, are locked up. Mm -hmm. It's locked down 23 out of 24 hours a day. Okay. It's, you know, high security. Um, it's where they put you if you're La, La Emi, like the Mo Mexican Mafia, mm -hmm. or you're, uh, you know, a uh, law enforcement agent, or you're a high security threat. Mm -hmm. Now, is there is there bars, or is it just solid, completely just enclosed? To, just completely enclosed. Okay, yeah, do you no have a bar. window at all? They have a trap door. Yeah, the window <laughs> is like, yay big, and, I mean, if you put your face up to it, it would be about this big, mm -hmm. right? And then they have a, just a solid metal door, in a, in a trap door about this way for food. So That's when do you get fed? Three times a day or is it? Yeah, like they wake you up in the morning and you eat and then they, they, they yeah, it's room service. Okay. <laughs> I wasn't, it's room service. Now, I mean, I, you I, don't I, have to tip. You you hear, know, you know, it's cool. <laughs> you hear a lot of things though about, you know, how they mistreat prisoners and things like that. I was right. wondering if that ever happened. I mean, was there times where you didn't get food? Was there times when they didn't let you out and kept you in for oh, several yeah, days? Yeah, yeah, the, 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 the Bureau of Prisons, I mean, it's, it's just a matter of what, you know, guards are working at what particular time. They're supposed to let you out for an hour a day. Sometimes they'd let you out maybe for five days for the hour a day, you know, right. during that eight months. Um, so, you know, there could be a, a security issue going on or something going on in the, in the, in the institution, right? Mm -hmm. So basically you're, you're in their control, you know, 24-7, and there's nothing you can do. But what my argument is, it was the, the reason that they placed me under this high security condition was all bullshit. Mm -hmm. I mean, to allege that I can call up some telephone number at NORAD and launch. whistle some codes to start a nuclear holocaust is, like, absurd. It's just Yet, like propaganda was, to keep you locked up, yeah, basically. Yeah, it was, I, I, more than the, what conditions I was under, which sucked, okay? Imagine yourself in the bathroom, 90, 70 to 90 watt bulb, five by nine, and you leave it for an hour a day. Mm -hmm. You probably couldn't lock yourself in there for two hours without going a little bit crazy, right? right? So, um, but the reason, the justification that the federal government was able to use was ludicrous. It was something out of a comic strip. See, that's what still boggles my mind today, mm -hmm. right? How, how did, did they do that? How did they get away with it? How did you keep your sanity the entire time? Well, I spent my time working with my lawyer and reading up on case law, rules of criminal procedure. So I was doing a, a hell of a lot of reading. I had an AM FM Walkman because on commissary, they call it commissary there where you can buy food and mm -hmm. stuff. They let you buy AM FM Walkman. So I used to listen to radio all the time. Did you get out in the general public ever? I mean, you were, you were only in there for eight months, so you were mixed in with the general public. Of the other well, they criminals. call it general population. General population yeah. for the rest of the time. Well, yeah, in that case, I, I ended up pleading out and I was put into a prison camp for four months. Okay. What's it like going to prison for as a hacker? I mean, there's murders, there's all different types of people that are true criminals here, not just, right. I mean, as a hacker coming in there, you probably don't match with a lot of these types of people. Not really. A lot of people want to pick your brain because they want to be able to use technology to commit 
crimes when they get out. Did you make friends while you were in there, talk to anybody? Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. there was a, a few people that I don't have any really contact with them today, mm -hmm. but uh, there was, you know, people that you're tight with that are friends. Right. You, know, you play cards, you hang out, um, you just talk. Did you ever get picked on at all, being in prison or anything like no, that? No, I, I got into a few fights. You know, um, uh, federal is a lot different than state. I mean, uh, it's between night and day. Usually in federal, you're pretty safe because there's always, like, you know, correctional officers around. Mm -hmm. um, but I didn't get in a few fights. It was uh, over somebody that took some of my property. And under in that environment, unless you go and reclaim it, even if you're going to get your ass kicked, you, you got to do it. Right. Otherwise, you'll be a mark to be taken advantage of. And so it what, happened on a few occasions. What happens at that point if you weren't to go get your ass kicked and you become a mark? I mean, what, what are people going to do to no, you? Just take your, take your stuff all the just, time because you're not going to do anything. They just know but, they can punk you around, basically. Right, exactly. So if someone goes and takes your stuff and you go claim it and you, and you, and you, you go and take the first punch, they're going to know, well, there's going to be a problem if I do this with this guy. Right. Either, even if you lose, it still creates a problem. Yeah. Right. That's pretty crazy. Yeah, it's a, it's a jungle. You know, uh, whenever I think of this, of the correctional system, I think of the AC, was it ACDC, Welcome to the Jungle? No, that was... Uh, uh, no, Guns N' Roses. Guns N' Roses. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Guns N' Roses, yeah. Just craziness. Well, not as much as in state or county jail. Mm -hmm. In county jail, it would be, if you went into county jail, the first thing they'd do is look at those tennis shoes. And then some guy, some uh, guy of a different race, probably 10 times bigger than you, all muscle, I just to say, the, I want those shoes. I just get the shit beat out of me pretty much, is what you're saying. Right. But if you give them the shoes without fighting for it... It's worse than... It's worse... It, really? It's worse, yeah. They get, yeah. So you would think you hand up the property, you know, everything's going to be okay, but that's not the case. That's you have not to... the case, because what happens is now you are a mark for everybody to take anything you get. Wow. Right. So now you're all done with that chapter right. of your life. That's pretty much all closed. Do you, Absolutely. Do you, uh, what are you doing now? Well, I started a security company called Defensive Thinking. It's uh, myself and one other guy. It's a, it's a, it's a consultancy. It's, pri it's uh, professional services. Um, I travel around the world, I do talks, mostly on social engineering and other information security or about my, myself. And I just um, I authored, co-authored a book called The Art of Deception, which is kind of the social engineering bible. Mm -hmm. and, I have the book. Right, good. <laughs> and I'm starting a new book this month called The Art of Intrusion, where I'm trying to convince people that have done any black hat hacking to come forward and tell me their best story. You know, the salacious, the sexy, the innovative, the clever. Right. Because I want to tell their story of the attack, because it's an interesting story, maybe a little bit about their personal background. Then I want to analyze the vulnerabilities that were exploited and then discuss what countermeasures businesses and individuals can take I see. to ensure it doesn't happen to them. So that's going to, that's basically the format of the new book. Story, analysis, countermeasures. Yeah, so what if someone is watching this and they want to send you their stories. What's, what email address should they send it to or where, where should they go? H-A-C-K-S at DefensiveThinking.com. Okay. All together. DefensiveThinking.com. Hacks. Hacks. Gotcha. Hacks at DefensiveThinking.com. Yeah. Kevin Mitnick, thank you very much. Hey, great to be here, Kevin. Thank Excellent. you. I hope it was a good interview. Very good. We'll see you again soon. Okay, thank All you. Right.